Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic, real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Welcome back. Um, a couple quick announcements. Number one, we are going to be in New York City speaking with um, some of the best agents in the world, the agents at Douglas Element. So there's going to be information coming about that. I'm not sure if they're going to open the doors for non-Douglas Element agents. They might. If you're interested in, in that event, let me know. But we are going to be in Manhattan. It's going to be uh, February. Julie, are you on? I think you are. Yes. So. Okay, I, it's, uh, what day are we? I think we're presenting what on the 12th and the, like the 13th? Uh, or the something 11th like that? and 12th. 11th and 12th. Okay, 11th and 12th. So if you are anywhere in or around about Manhattan and you are a coaching plan or a podcast listener or you've purchased our book or just whatever, we'd love to meet you. I'm, I'm, I would be stunned if they didn't welcome non Douglas Solomon agents into the event. Um, but let me know and email me directly, and I'll connect you. I don't have a specific website or whatnot. It's Tim at Tim and Julie Harris dot com, and I'll connect you. So again, that's happening the beginning of next month. Now, number two, I want to remind you that we are looking for we have our Help Wanted sign up, and we're looking for new member coaches. And new member coaches is a real sales position. So we're always looking for new member coaches, by the way. So if you're interested in working directly as part of our organization as a new member coach, let me know. Um, and uh, Tim at TimAndJulieHarris.com, and I'll connect you to our sales manager, Andrew. Number three, we have gotten a published date, and some of you have been asking about this, on our new updated book, which is looking like it's going to be a massive success, greater than the one that came out was it Julie last? No, it was the year before last, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's looking like it's going to be a best, like sell more than the previous one based on interest from bookstores and whatnot. Um, and that's going to be coming out, we think, based on what we're tell being told, June of 2019. Um, and the last announcement is that we are um, ha we have caught up with all the demand for free uh, coaching calls. So if you'd like a free coaching call, you could probably have one uh, still today. Um, or first thing tomorrow. So just go to freecoachingcallsforagents.com, freecoachingcallsforagents.com, and you'll speak um, directly with someone who's going to help you make your 2019 business plan and also uh, give you, when, just by requesting your free coaching call, you're given seven free books. I know some of you guys are having problems downloading the links, but we fixed that problem. And the seven free books, the one I want you to start with immediately is the real estate treasure map, and that is your fill-in-the-blank 2019 business plan. Save the download because you guys can use that year after year. It's literally the same business plan that Julie and I use. It's the one that we have all of our top clients using. So, Julie, you have got – it's Julie, it's story time with Julie today, podcast <laughs> listeners. <laughs> That's what it is. It's all it's week. Story time. I warned them. It's story time with Aunt Julie. <laughs> I know. Well, but first, uh, right from our private Facebook page for our premier coaching members and our elite coaching members – um, an interesting conversation going on uh, that was started by Austin Howard Skeen about uh, buyer agency agreements. And um, the comment was, I've had a string of bad luck over the last week. Who uses buyer agent agreements? Uh, first time in real estate I've been so frustrated it's brought tears to my eyes. People have very little loyalty anymore. So there's kind of a nice discussion going on there. And I chimed in reminding everyone that we have a turnkey buyer presentation already done for you as part of Premier Coaching. Um, and, you know, I always remind people what's included in that. Everyone likes to roam around saying buyers are liars and all this kind of thing, and we all know that being a listing agent is the true solution, but meanwhile, you're working with buyers. So inside the buyer presentation, when we put that together, we listed out all of the things that drive everyone crazy. Buyers going to an open house and buying through that agent without you, well, hold on, Julie, new construction, hold on, hold on. all that kind of stuff, and it's addressed hey, there. Do Go it. ahead. Yes. You, you're skipping a, a point, right? The point of the buyer's presentation is to, to um, for you to have a formalized presentation with the buyer to get them to commit to working exclusively with you. 
Um, and yes. this is part of premier. This is part of premier coaching. You skip that step. So you guys know that you have to have a listing presentation. You know you have to have a pre-listing pack. But you then don't have that same level of professionalism when you're working on the buyer side. We've done the heavy lifting for you. Just use the buyer prequalification script. Just follow it through. Existing coaching members, don't change it. Download it. Use it. It asks all the hard questions. It, you find out whether they're working with other, uh, other realtors. So, because the reality of it is, is buyers aren't liars. It's just that agents aren't professional enough to know what questions to ask. So if you would ask that agent, uh, if that agent had asked, for example, whether the buyer was working with anybody else, whether they had any other, you know, I had an experience early on in our career, and this is a true story, um, and this is what caused us to basically take our own lack of professionalism on the buyer side seriously. I had a buyer, actually I had this happen twice. You know, Julia, we, as some of you guys know, we actually sold real estate. Hey, how about that? Coaches that sold real estate. <laughs> but, you know, we yeah. sold over 100 houses our first year in the business. We were sort of the darlings of the National Association of Realtors. Went on a, who cares? This was like forever ago. This, and I'm, you know, Julia and I are in our 40s, and this happened when we were in our 20s. But anyway, moral of the story is, is in that, in our sort of uh, early learning years, what I had buyers, and um, I had one buyer in particular, and this is what this buyer would do. They were relocating. They were spending a decent amount of money. It was all the right things. Met them in an open house. I remember this exactly. Perfect buyers, not looking for something crazy, realistic expectations. So they were staring, staying at this hotel. I'm not making up what I'm telling you guys. And I would pick them up every freaking Saturday and every freaking Sunday, and this happened for like a month and a half in a row. I would buy them lunch. We would talk about what we saw, and then we would take them back. I would take them back to the hotel and drop them off. And, oh, that was a great time. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So it turns out that they weren't just looking on the area of town I was showing them. They were looking on the other area of town, too, with another I realtor. And, and get this. Mm -hmm. I know. It's hilarious. And get this. That other realtor was uh, basically in the parking lot as I was dropping these people off every Saturday and every Sunday for that whole month and a half waiting for those people because they didn't eat in their lunch. They go back in their hotel, freshen up, and then they were coming yeah. out, jumping in the other realtor's car, going to the other end of town and looking for houses. Now, then I get this nice little email, and they say, blah, 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 blah. We you know, we'd been doing this all along. We were working at the other uh, – da, 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 da. you don't work in that part of town. But then I was like pissed, <laughs> just mad, yeah. oh, just ugh. Buyers are liars. I sound like all you guys sound. But then I realized it was my fault for not telling them, not asking if they're working with another agent. My fault for not asking if they're looking in other areas of town. Not my fault for not telling them that I can help them in other areas of town. My fault for not asking them to sign a buyer's agency agreement. So all of the things that went wrong were from my lack of professionalism. And by taking that responsibility, that's when Julie and I basically created this buyer's presentation that you guys all get as part of Premier Coaching. And you can do it online. You can make our presentation into a video you can do it so that you know this is on the buyer side but then you present to them you find out what their motivation is you find out how long they've been looking you find out if they have anything to sell you find out all the things you want to know and then do it and you so, educate and them it. how to behave right but it, and, and asking all these pre-qualification questions you actually might discover that you don't want to work with them because they're ah if i can't find the perfect whatever i'm just not gonna you guys get the point this is a thing this is what you have to do in a market like this you ha and all of you who are working with buyers, you need to take your time more seriously because you don't get that back, right? So if you're spinning your wheels looking for buyers, uh, work, looking for buyers, you know, and working all the nights and weekends and all the off hours because they, they have normal jobs and they want you to sacrifice, you know, your nights and weekends because that's when they're not – all that stuff. That's how you guys lose years in real estate with not making any money because you never ask the right questions. And why don't you ask the right questions? Because you're afraid of finding out that the buyer's not worth work looking or working with. You're afraid of hearing no. You're afraid of asking a question that's going to cause them to say, oh, I'm not answering that. In other words, you're afraid of anything that even remotely resembles resistance. So when you use our uh, conversational outlines, a.k.a. script, when you follow the buyer presentation, when you go through the process that we've already created for you, you won't get any resistance, and they'll appreciate the fact that you are professional. That's how you need to evolve to think about yourself as a professional. And then what happens is you are going to feel much more proud of yourself, and you're not going to look at your list of buyers or the hanky-janky buyer you have to take out tomorrow and think, I know in my heart of hearts this person's probably not ever going to buy, but I have nothing else going on because I need to make a paycheck. And I think maybe one day somehow possibly when all the stars align, this will become a real buyer. 
you won't have any experiences like that anymore because you will have transcended and you'll become a professional. Julie? Yes, and in conclusion, don't forget to know your magic number and be a really killer listing agent, and then you will really have a lot fewer conversations like this. But in the meantime, of course, use a buyer agreement. I, I don't know who set that up in the beginning that we do listing agreements, but buyer agreements are somehow optional. It just seems crazy to me, but you know, now we get to all fix well, but, but, whatever but this, happened there. But you, you, you bring that up, and it, <clears> it's, it, that's <throat> when we talked about buyer agency agreement. We go to some markets when you and I are, you know, it's even on the podcast, and we get people that basically are almost religiously opposed to doing, uh, to having buyer's agency contracts signed. Guys, you guys can make your buyer's agency contracts so they're similar to your listing contracts that there's like an easy exit listing. You can, you can do your buyer's agency contract any way you want to. The real point of the buyer's agency contract is because when most people put their names on the line, digitally or otherwise, generally speaking, most people are honorable and they're going to abide by the agreement. You know, am I saying if you have a buyer that you signed into a buyer agency agreement and you put that buyer into uh, some situation where they're going to be, uh, you know, buy, walk into a new build and that new build's going to somehow magically, you know, they're going to sign on the line with that builder, you're supposed to sue that buyer? No, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is it does create a more of a real substantial attachment between you and that buyer. Julie? It does. It sets the expectations. And you should be able to sleep better at night knowing you went over all of those things with the buyer. And, you know, it's what are they going to do for you? What are you going to do for them? And straightening all that out. So <clears throat> all that came from a little conversation starter on the Facebook page. So back to our series on don't decrease the goal, increase the effort. That's our theme this year to remind you guys, that, you know, sometimes that's a certain day where you feel like, you know what, this is just too hard. I, maybe I'll just adjust the goal. Sometimes it's a quarter that goes sideways on you. Sometimes you're facing the year down, especially this time of year. A lot of you guys came off your best year ever last year, and now you've got to do it all over again. It's easy to think that way, but you're not allowed to decrease the goal, simply increase the effort. So I've been sharing some stories with you of people's uh, success stories who increased their effort so that when you have those days where – you have a crazy appraisal issue or an inspection problem or you find out a buyer bought with somebody else, not that that ever happens, right, that you can think about all of these people who went before you and because they persevered, they got their success. So we're going to talk about Walt Disney today and mm -hmm. let's see who else I pulled out. <clears throat> um, chicken soup for the soul guy, Jack Canfield as well. So two, two quick stories of success. So everybody knows the iconic brand of Disney, but the story of how Walt Disney created the empire is inspiring. As a young man, Walt Disney was fired from the local newspaper as his boss thought that he lacked creativity. Can you imagine somebody thinking Walt Disney lacks creativity? After a failed animation company went under, he was barely able to even pay his bills and ate dog food to survive. So when you're sitting there at your desk and you're frustrated because an appraisal came in low, think about Walt Disney eating dog food before he came to Disney that we know him as. With his last few dollars, he made his way out to Hollywood to try and make it big. But unfortunately, his early time in Hollywood was just as bad as the experiences before. He was told that Mickey Mouse would fail. <laughs> he faced constant rejection and seemed destined to never succeed. Well, there's more to the story, but that's the summary because we all know how Walt Disney turned out. He obviously persisted and went on to grow the company with amusement parks, feature films, and is known as a cultural icon. And I believe, was it him? I, I think he ended up buying... I didn't put this in our notes, but I believe he ended up buying the newspaper that fired him as yeah. kind of a, you know, <laughs> an F you, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> but I thought that was interesting. So he continued to persevere. And, you know, we've been talking about these stories. How quickly do you give up? And you can apply that question to pretty much everything in real estate. How quickly do you give up on your lead follow-up, on your, Julie, can I talk you know, about that talking for a second? Yeah, yeah, of course. Go. So I'm a, so I like what you I like the theme of what you just picked up on. Um, a lot of things that I hear when we're uh, listening, reading, talking to people, doing events, is that they don't come out and say it, but you can tell by looking at them they have given up. And I hear and see and experience a lot of people that are giving up when because they think they're too old. I don't see a lot of that so much in the you know younger sort. Those guys are you know unbridled enthusiasm, which is always good. But in the too old side of things. Guys, there are here's a little simple fact. 
I realize that our country celebrates the young you know, success story, but the reality of it is most people don't uh, even come close to achieving their greatest levels of success until they're in the 50s. And this is a success for business people as uh, essentially money. That's what we're talking about. Money and career um, accomplishment is generally experienced at its height when you're in your 50s and your early 60s. And I'm going to give you guys an example. And these are, this is the recent one I know many of you won't really relate to, but um, I'm a big car nerd. I always have been. Cars for me are a little tchotchke to keep myself motivated. So Enzo Ferrari did not make – and Enzo Ferrari is arguably – Ferrari's become arguably probably the world's most prestigious brand. I mean, I can't think of a brand that's more prestigious or more sought after or more anything than Ferrari. Well, he didn't start making road cars until he was 49. So the guy was basically, you know, exactly about my age when he actually started doing something other than making racing cars and making road cars, which he's known for racing, but obviously most people know him for his road cars. How amazing is that? Well, here's another story, and this one's another one that many of you probably heard of before. Um, and again, Julie and I could just talk about uh, people who achieve the greatest level of success in their 50s and 60s that are famous until the cows come home because it's so common. That's the truth, because they didn't give up. Uh, Colonel Sanders. I mean, you know, the guy who started yep. KFC. There's another example. I think he was in his 60s or something. The 60s, and, something and I read about him 70s. when I was researching this. He, uh, one thing I read was that he didn't start it until after he had received his first Social Security check. So it had to be 60-something. <laughs> well, maybe right? not when he started. It could have been like maybe 50-something no, because people didn't have the longevity that they do now. But, yeah, so True. there it is. I mean, and there's there's countless examples of that of people who, uh, so I wonder when you guys are you know when we're sitting and when we're standing in front of you in an event, or we're in your ear right now or all those types of things. I honestly wonder how frequently you are listening to what we're saying and you're telling yourself, I wish I would have heard this 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. I wish I would have you know I remember sort of feeling like I'm feeling right now by listening to Tim and Julie 20 or 30 years ago. And then that's the end of it. In other words, basically you say, screw it, I'm done. I have got no other potential left in me. How many of you listening right now fall into that trap? Well, here's, here's the thing that's really kind of shocking. I run into people, I mean I say I, it's obviously Julie and I, and all of our coaches, we run into people on a regular basis who are in their 30s who act like that, who are in their 40s who act like that. <clears throat> and, I, and you get – you try to – I had a great call this morning, two great calls with coaching clients – and we were talking about the fact – now, these guys are – had you know, I've been coaching these guys for three and four years, um, maybe one of them for five. And they've been working long and hard at basically – it's the whole thing of between uh, working on their um, – really their mindset with regards to doing what they don't want to do and they don't want to do it at the highest level and their skill set. And they've ebbed and flowed. They've had good months, bad months. Some of them had good years, bad years. But both of these guys are just on fire, just having their best years ever. But what they finally realized was even though they had been exposed to, um, you know, the whole doing what you don't want to do and you don't want to do at the highest level and some of the other things that we talk about constantly on this podcast and in our books and our coaching calls, they didn't really put all the pieces together until they stayed on the path doing the consistent work for long enough. And so they – and I had – Brandon actually really had this interesting comment. He said um, he didn't realize how much he was still – being seduced up until probably in a meaningful way up until probably about maybe 18 months ago by the idea that you have to be passionate in order to be successful or the idea that you should pursue your passion or the greatest pursuit of life is being happy and he didn't realize how sort of um, omnipresent and I would say repressive those types of thoughts had become with his ability to actually do what he didn't want to do and he didn't want to do at the highest level and you know this is something that I see in a lot of people when Julie and I you know, I, this is a true story. When we were out in Hawaii recently talking to that wonderful group of agents at Elite, and we talked to them, and we said those straight up to their best agents, we said, listen, you're not doing your job unless you hear, are putting yourself in a position to hear no at least five times um, a day. And this was at over a little dinner where they were drinking and they were having side conversations, a lot of them. I mean, for the most part, they were paying attention. And then the gasp that we heard when I said that, they literally didn't know what to say. Because they live not to ever put themselves, most of them, not all of them, I know some of them, they totally understood where I was coming from, but most of them have built lives and careers and methods of lead generation around the idea of never hearing no. But what's on the other side of being able, what's on the other side of the willingness to hear no? What, what comes on the other side of that? You're able to help more people, and this goes back to my conversation I had with Brandon. You know, when I was talking with Brandon today, 
he's a very uh, religious guy. And, you know, a lot of Julie and I's founding beliefs of our company are certainly based in Christianity. A lot of the – by the way, guys, our country, most of the things that you take as just normal day-to-day type things, it's based in essentially teachings from the Bible. I don't know if all of you guys knew that, but it's true. So we're having this conversation with uh, – and, and, and Brand is talking about how he's realizing that, you know, it's, it's truly not the, the accomplishment or the arrival. It's the journey that, where he gets the most charge from, and that's true for most people. When you arrive at a specific goal, you enjoy it for a short period of time, but your very DNA it gets more of a charge out of actually pursuing the next goal. And to fight against that or to think there's something wrong with that actually is wrong. And that's where I see a lot of people falling short is they will have the potential of becoming unbelievable people, writing books, you know, it doesn't matter, building schools, hospitals, if you want to think of it like that, or just having these really outrageous, wonderful lives that are full of whatever levels of opulence they decide to give themselves. But they sell themselves short because they get too uh, mired in the belief that, oh, my gosh, it's, you know, it's, life is about you know, do, pursuing your passions. And, oh, my gosh, you are, you ha, you've accomplished so much. Don't you think you should stop and smell the roses? See, I'm telling you guys all this because what happens is all those types of thoughts, they will cause you to slow your momentum down, if not lose your momentum completely. And then you're going to have years pass where you're going to wonder what the hell happened. And then occasionally you'll come across somebody who didn't stop and smell the roses for a protracted period of time, meaning years, who did stay true to their uh, you know, preordained designed mission to basically be in the pursuit of the best version of themselves. Um, and they've accomplished so many more things in your life and in their lives, and you think, oh, my gosh, what happened? How is it that they got so far ahead of me? It's for the reasons I'm telling you. But here's the full circle thing. If you really want to know what keeps somebody motivated, what, if you really want to know what keeps somebody like uh, you know, Brandon, who I was just talking about, what's really driving him is, yes, earning money, yes, taking care of his wonderful family, yes, accomplishing of his goals, but what's really driving him, what is really making him proud of himself and happy and, and keeping himself charged at the highest level is he's helping people. And that's where all this goes. He sees himself solving problems that other people, you know, their house doesn't sell or it's a for sale by owner that doesn't necessarily have their act together knowing what, and they're leaving money on the table. They're doing something, you know, all those things. He is in the pursuit, in, in the quest for, you know, the best version of himself. But in doing so, he's had to become a stellar uh, salesperson or a stellar real estate professional, which means he's had to learn how to help people in all sorts of diverse situations, which means he's had to get past – his innate desire to never hear no. That's where he gets his charge from because he's having people. I had a call, an earlier coaching call this morning, and this is an incredibly successful person. He was telling me how he went to a closing, and the seller was losing a significant amount of money, but they were so grateful that the house sold. And he was getting a big commission check, but it wasn't the commission check that he was telling me about or what he was going to do with the commission check. It was the feeling of having solved a problem for somebody, and this problem had evidently been weighing on them, you know, adversely affecting their marriage, and they were living in separate places, that, sort of, that type of situation. That is where you ultimately get the most fulfillment on this planet is being of service to other people. But the longer you stay skill-free, <laughs> the longer you stay in a position of, your, of not willing to ask questions where you might hear no, the fewer people you're going to be able to help, which means ultimately you're never really going to accomplish anything or anything uh, you know, in comparison to what you otherwise could accomplish. Julie, does this, are we on the same wavelength yeah. here with this? No, it absolutely does. And you know, you have to be conscious about all these things and not just – have stuff happen to you, you have to take control of it. And that's why we're sharing all of these various stories this week of the stick to nature, the perseverance that people have. And I will talk briefly about Jack Canfield. We know him as the creator of Chicken Soup for the Soul. He also had another series called the Success Series. And uh, when he and his co-author, Mark Victor Hansen, pitched the original Chicken Soup for the Soul, and I can appreciate this, they they went to over 130 different publishers, and none of them were interested. I often heard, quote, nobody wants to read about 100 inspirational stories. After 100-plus pitches, their agent dropped them, but they were determined to get the book published. Luckily, they never gave up. They continued to persevere until their book was picked up by a small publisher in Florida. So now there are over 250 Chicken Soup for the Soul books and over 500 million copies 
sold worldwide. If they had given up, those inspirational stories wouldn't be out there. I probably wouldn't even be reading about their inspirational story if they had given up. Okay, so imagine not only did they go to over 130 publishers, but their agent was so frustrated that they decided to drop the project altogether. So they kept on persevering. How fast are you giving up? You have got to keep your foot on the gas. And Tim, you were talking about the journey being um, more exciting, more fulfilling than the finish line. I remember I used to get depressed after big concerts because there was so much rehearsal time and there was so much uh, passion involved in really learning and internalizing music for what, a 30-minute concert? And then it was over. It was almost a letdown. I remember when we did our uh, our first year of 100-plus homes, it was almost like, are we going to get an award or something, like a big check in the mail? Is Ed McMahon going to show up and give us something, right? But no, it was the journey that was so important, as hopefully you guys are picking up from some of these short stories of uh, perseverance that I'm sharing with you this week. And on that note, I'm going to scoot on over to my premier coaching session. Um, hopefully you guys can internalize some of these stories. And, you know, maybe if that means that you're reminding yourself of Walt Disney sitting at his desk with his dog food can open, okay, that's worse than what you're going through in real estate today. I guarantee it. So I'll toss it over to you, and I'll go bug my premier coaching clients with more of this type of thing. <laughs> you guys are going to have your mindsets worked on today, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so, so listen, guys, here, here's the bottom line. Uh, everyone is at differing stages of sort of the becoming the best version of themselves. I'll, I'm going to tell you guys one little Enzo and one more Enzo Ferrari story. I'm reading this massive book. It's like I'm, it's over a thousand pages. It's ridiculous. I didn't know it was this book when I, big when I bought it, but I'm going to get through it. Damn it. So uh, Enzo was once asked. What was his goal? Like, what is sort of the driving force? Those kind of silly questions that people ask that are sort of like, you know, a dumb question. But anyway, he said the best answer ever, uh, and you guys should maybe consider this as your answer when thinking about that yourself. He says it was his goal in life was to become Enzo Ferrari. Okay, I want you to think about that for a second. What was he saying? He was saying, okay, he had this vision of himself, of the person he could be. And he was working towards that goal. Maybe he was also saying there was a vision because, you know, in Italy, the guy is still revered. You know, there is this vision that other people have him that maybe a half of him that maybe he had to, you know, that he was pursuing. So many different ways you can interpret that answer. But I think that's a wonderful answer, don't you? So why not when asking yourself what my purpose is or some of you guys, sometimes you, you just totally run out of steam. I get it emotionally, especially in a market like this where sellers are under so much stress and buyers are you know, bouncing around. By the way, guys, the best way for you to keep your emotions between the, the rails is to have a formalized business approach to your business. And when you do use uh, you know, listing presentations and buyer presentations, or you do use buyer prequalification scripts and seller prequalification scripts, it – keeps your emotions between the lines because you're not ever you, you know what you're dealing with as far as the client's motivation you know what you're dealing with as far as all the moving parts of the potential transaction and you're it, the thing that will uh, shock you and will get you off your game in the in this you know in a market like this is our surprises where you just you know the buyer at the last minute you know like i was telling you my story it turns out the buyer was working with another agent across town and you know all that those are the things that take the wind out of your sails but you can eliminate the risk of those things happen, happening if you just basically have a formalized approach to your business. And here's the other side stream benefit of having the formalized approach to your business is that people, buyers and sellers, actually will respect you more because you're not like every other agent. They'll see that you have a formalized approach to your business, and they actually will treat you with more respect, which is not really the intention of it in the first place, but that is what happens. So Enzo said, my goal is to become Enzo Ferrari. I'll suggest to you that your goal should become the best version of yourself, and doing so, you have to become – you guys chose this. Look, it wasn't easy to get your real estate license. That was pretty boring, wasn't it? So you've got it. Now, maybe you've had it for years, and you've, you know you've been holding yourself back, or maybe you just got it, and you're just looking for some real you know, straight direction. It's focus, guys. It's all about following one course until successful. The here and there approach that many of you take, not just to business but in life in general, it just – doesn't work. That's your ego trying to create excuse. Like so, for example, if Julie and I give you a proven path to success, 
and and you're just you know you're convinced intellectually that it'll get you there, and yet you still go and and you know henpeck other ideas and sort of change what we ask you to do. A lot of you do that. You sort of think somehow magically you have superior level knowledge that's going to make it so that you can create your own you know real estate success story based on your why why bother doing that. That's here's ultimately the reason you're doing that. I'm going to save you the learning curve. You're doing that so that when it doesn't work and you fail, you have something to make you have a backup excuse. You could say, "You know what? This particular direct mail campaign or branding campaign or social networking campaign that I thought was going to, you know, that I was going to somehow magically interweave into what I was learning from Tim and Julie. You know, I was going to take what Tim and Julie were doing and I was going to add something I learned from this website and this Facebook group. I was going to create my own. Many of you do that, but then when it fails and it doesn't work, you don't know what didn't work. So what you did, what your ego did, is it actually created a great uh, cushion for you to fail. Because then when you fail, you're like, oh, you know what? It's just because this aspect or that aspect. You don't really know why. But versus showing up for boot camp where you have a drill sergeant telling you exactly what to do, exactly how to do it, exactly, exactly, exactly. And then sure enough, after boot camp's over, you are a different person. That's what, frankly, guys, that's really what premier coaching is. And if you want to shorten your path up the mountain and avoid all the pitfalls and avoid all the you know, jagged rock edges and all the rest of it, then you've got to be taking and asking yourself, why am I making my life and why am I making my journey so hard? Why don't I just do exactly what Tim and Julie said, exactly they, as they told me how to do it, and just shorten my learning curve and realize that ultimately what they're expressing, especially on today's podcast, is what I truly want to have. I want to have that feeling of being um, you know, of being of service to other people. I want to have that feeling of knowing I can help other people. And then the money, I'm not going to say the money follows because it doesn't. You have to make the money happen. That's the truth. But the reality of it is, is you become the best version of you. Or as Enzo Ferrari said, you know, you become you. You become the person that you had the potential of becoming. That is the feeling of success, guys knowing that you're doing it. The arrival of doing it just means it's time for you to reset and do something else that's even bolder. So if there's anything we can do for you, it's Tim at TimAndJulieHarris.com or Julie at TimAndJulieHarris.com. You guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you on the show tomorrow. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at TimAndJulieHarris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris.